Welcome to Strip Cuddler, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for a review, a review of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by the incomparable James Joyce. You make it sound so nice, but no, no. Yes. No. I'm going to yes. get hate for this video. I am. Y you are. Oh. Um, and you've proven, if nothing else, over the last three years to be uh, borderline illiterate. So we will... We will figure this out today with a review, three good things, three bad things, quotes, literary analysis, rating, and recommendation based on the text. Let's start Joyce. things off. Let's get into it. It's brutal. It's a brutal text. It's yeah. a difficult text. So again, if you've made it this far, if you've read along with us, I, I commend you because this is insanely difficult. This is, of course, a master level text. Uh, it's a big one. It's one that everybody is, it's on the list. You should read this book. You should at least try it, I think. <sighs> but uh, try as you may. It is difficult. Quotes? Would you like to start with quotes? Why would we start with quotes? It feels good, I don't know. Would you like to start with three good things, three bad things? Yes! Let's do that then. Three good things, three bad things. What do you got? Is this your first time, Dalton? I think so. It's been like nine years since we filmed, so. <laughs> three good things. Number one, verisimilitude. This is a real text. These are real People, you are here with Stephen Daedalus okay. this entire time. You grow with him, you know him, and you understand the person and the decisions that they're having to make. Two, this is as throw a dive into a character's psyche as I have ever gotten. Okay. Three, I uh, really had fun with some of the terms that get thrown around, learning some new uh, slang from a different area and a different time. It feels very authentic. It does. It does. Uh, I have, from a writer's standpoint, it's incredibly well crafted. It's incredibly well done, well written. Uh, nothing but praise in that aspect towards it. Uh, number two, the struggle of the budding artist is always a big seller. It's something that I think will always be something worth reading because it's something that always fascinates people. So the concept what we're dealing with here, I'm all about. I'm in for. And number three, no matter what your shtick is, no matter what you enjoy, you're going to find it. There is nothing but layers upon layers upon layers in this book. Whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to analyze, you'll find something in here that you can pick at. Okay. Bad things. Bad things. Number one, stream of consciousness has its limitations. Yep. Number two, it was difficult for me to follow who was talking at times. Uh, sometimes there are groups of people and the tags are either non-existent sometimes or you get them at a strange place within the text. So I wasn't sure who was saying what, which goes into character building, which sort of, sort of makes the whole thing sort of uh, rocky at times. And number three, this is a bad thing, I'm glad to be done. Okay. I'm glad that I'm done with this text, and I don't like feeling that, especially for something that is so highly regarded throughout uh, throughout all of literature. Okay. Uh, again, maybe I sometimes put uh, books like this on a pedestal, and I expect too much of them. But uh, it was a disappointment. It, it, it fizzles out on me. It just it didn't deliver what I wanted it to deliver. Uh, number two, you're going to get lost in this somewhere. Every single chapter is different. Every single chapter is difficult. Uh, no matter where you are in your readership, at some point in here, you're going to have to pause and ask yourself, what the hell did I just read? And you're going to have to go back. It's a difficult text. Uh, and number three, uh, people are not going to like it when you disagree about this book. I'm going to call this the road rule. Uh, people aren't going to like it when you talk uh, a little smack on it. Okay. And I think that's where I'm going with this. Okay. Anyway. Quotes. Can we do quotes now? Yeah. I'm so excited. Let's now. do quotes now. Um, from 182 of my text. The soul is born, he said vaguely, first in those moments I told you of. It has a slow and dark birth, more mysterious than the birth of the body. When the soul of a man is born in this country, there are nets flung at it to hold it back from light. You talk to me of nationality, language, religion. I shall try to fly by those nets. From 56 of my text, they would be alone, surrounded by darkness and silence, and in that moment of supreme tenderness, he would be transfigured. He would fade into something impalpable under her eyes, and then in a moment, he would be transfigured. Weakness and timidity and inexperience would fall from him in that magic moment. 
Look at you, James Joyce. You romantic. 183. Pity is the feeling which arrests the mind in the presence of whatsoever is grave and constant in human sufferings and unites it with the human sufferer. Terror is the feeling which arrests the mind in the presence of whatsoever is grave and constant in human sufferings that unites it with the secret cause. From 148. His heart trembled, his breath came faster, and a wild spirit passed over his limbs as though he was soaring sunward. His heart trembled in ecstasy of fear, and his soul was in flight. His soul was soaring into the air. His soul was soaring in an air beyond the world and the body he knew. He was purified in a breath and delivered in certitude and made radiant and commingled with the element of the spirit. An ecstasy of flight made radiant his eyes and wild his breath and tremulous and wild and radiant his windswept limbs. Beauty, expressed by the artist, cannot awaken in us an emotion which is kinetic or a sensation which is purely physical. It awakens or ought to awaken or induces or ought to induce an aesthetic stasis, an ideal pity or an idea, terror or stasis, called forth, prolonged, and at last dissolved by what I call a rhythm of the beauty. Do you have any others? Yeah, I've got a couple more. Okay. We are right, he said, and the others are wrong. To speak of those things and to try to understand their nature and having understood it, to try slowly and humbly and constantly to express, to press out again from those from the gross earth or what it brings forth, from sound and shape and color, which are the prisons gates of our, which are the prison gates of our soul. An image of beauty we have come to understand. That is art. To twelve. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Taking Stephen's arm, he went on again and said, Do not fear that those words may be spoken to you on the... Do you not fear that those words may be spoken to you on the day of judgment? What is offered me on the other hand? Stephen asked. An eternity of bliss in the company of the Dean of Studies? I thought that was a pretty funny moment. And then we get a... Oh, do you have no... Oh, go on, go on. Get this weird quote on 198 of my text... Which I'm just not sure what to do with. Humbled and saddened by the dark shame of womanhood. Oh, that's a tattoo right there. If I've ever heard one. Humbled and saddened by the dark shame of womanhood. If the review of Portrait of the Artist gets to 10,000 views, Adrian will get that tattooed on him. I'm throwing <laughs> that out right now. We will make it happen. We'll film it. It'll be a time. But I'm not letting you say where. No. <laughs> It's a surprise. Uh, highly quotable. A lot of good literature going on The here. weird part to me was all of my quotes happened in Chapter 5. Okay. And Chapter 5 read very Nietzsche to me. Okay. It was just, it, what do you think of this? Well, I think this. Oh, do you? Yes, I do. And I also think this. You know, it's... But that's at the point of the novel when Stephen is uh, starting to really uh, not only question things, but come into his own. Uh, so that, that's an acceptable response to that. I, I can give you that. Um, I... <sighs> I don't know where to start with this one. Let's start where you started last time. Okay. Which you started to talk about stream of consciousness. Okay. And you started to talk about the third person. So in the last chapter of this, the last few pages, we get a shift in narration where we're no longer in this stream of consciousness inner workings of Stephen. We are in the pinned word of Stephen. And it... it it's interesting because it, it, it is two different styles of narration. It is. Uh, we're getting these uh, little written diary entries. We even get the dates listed with them. And it's a different style of narration, but it's also the same. Because the stream of consciousness is uh, a wholehearted looking of the inner minds of Stephen. I, I don't know the best way to describe that. It is the intrinsic mind that is Stephen. But at this point, we are getting the written word. It's not what he's thinking, it's what he's writing. It's what he believes, what he knows. They're very similar, and they both serve separate purposes. At this point, Stephen is no longer wondering. He's knowing. He's pinning things. He is the artist at this point. Uh, he's taking the knowledge that he's been mulling around in his brain this entire book, 
and now we're putting words to page. We've developed, we've grown. And that's an important part of a story is the growth of the character. This entire story is Stephen trying to find himself. And in these last few little pages here, while he's still trying to go on this journey to find who he is, we see the growth, we see the change, a shift in narration, a more tangible style of narration, if you will, there's a difference. And I think that's very important. Well, it becomes first person. It does. The entire novel is third person, but stream of consciousness, which doesn't really slap you in the face until that final section. Okay. With Stephen's first-hand thoughts. It wakes you up. And the way that that is done, so, <coughs> pardon me, you have... Third person narration, Dalton went to the store. But you have stream of consciousness. Dalton went to the store. He wasn't thinking about what he was supposed to get. He was thinking about the cigarettes that he thought he needed, that he felt he needed, that he knew he would have to have. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that's known that's what is known as a close psychic distance. Okay. So the the neat trick that Joyce plays on us at the end is the entire time we're reading this, we're in third person. We're looking at Stephen Daedalus. Okay. At the end, we become Stephen Daedalus because we are then in a first-person narrative. And the reason that, that is such a trick is because it is not until the end of the novel, those last few pages, that Stephen Daedalus becomes... Stephen Daedalus. The entire time he is struggling with all of these things in his life, all of these decisions he has to make, all of these sides from which he may have to choose, which come to be false sides, because he doesn't choose any of them. And in the moment he decides he doesn't choose any of them, we are reading first person Stephen. Okay. So we are becoming first person Stephen. Uh, it is an interesting trick. And even if, uh, if you've made it this far, I'm going to say you got some chops. If you've made it to that. Uh, but it does take you aback a little bit, regardless, because it's a complete shift. But it's it, it, it's a complete shift, but it's still the same. It's very interesting. It's well done. It's very well done. Did you have more? Were you going on oh, with something? I, no, I mean that's so that that's the whole point I have for that is that that's why that's such a neat trick at the end. But what happens is the entire time you're lulled into sleep by this close psychic distance, and you are presented all of these. <sighs> Rare is the case that someone did not have to make a decision about religion in their life. Okay. Rarer is the case that someone did not have to make a decision at the level of that in magnitude at some point in their life. So the entire time, if you've had to make the religion decision in your life, you say you've not, right? You never made the religious decision. You were just kind of atheist from birth and you were never indoctrinated into any one sort of set of rules okay um anyone who has had to make that decision and sometimes the decision is to stay with your religion right uh sometimes the decision is i don't want to be catholic i want to be lutheran or vice versa or whatever anyone who has gone through that will undoubtedly relive those experiences at some point during this text okay but when you're thinking about that decision in your own life, you're thinking about yourself in the third person. Interesting. You are looking back. So for me, it was around 2011, 2012, 2013 that I was really mulling these things, these ideas. And I'm thinking about myself in third person when those things happen. At the end of this book, you're speaking in the first person. Okay. You are left to grab that mantle yourself because of the work which has been put in earlier in this book. Okay. How many people do you know that didn't have a scuffle with classmates at some point? It's fair. Well, Stephen does, and you put yourself in there, and Stephen prevailed. So you get a little taste of that victory, too. Okay. So from a writer's standpoint, uh, well done. It, it is very well done. How many people do you know that at some point in their burgeoning adulthood did not have a sudden and more clear look at their family. Okay. And he has that awakening, doesn't he? He does. And you did you refill your 
look at your family when that happened? It does put you into the story. So I mold around and mold around, and I you have to find something. You have to find something that makes you uh, really appreciate the text, something you can really grasp at here. And as much as this text talks about uh, religion and the Jesuit religion, going into a Christianity, essentially. Christianity. I, I think there's a lot of good Eastern philosophy slung into this as well, which is something I tend to gravitate towards. I like the idea of it because it really comes down to an idea of balance. Stephen is searching for balance in his life. And when it goes to it, he has to go to both extremes. He goes full bore monk. He uh, does everything for God. He goes full sin. He sees both sides of the spectrum, and the entire story is about Stephen trying to find this balance, trying to find what is correct for him. And in order to do so, he had to go a little too far, which is fine. But I like that idea. I like the idea of balance being in this story. And I, I think that does play very well in here when you look at it from that standpoint. Uh, in order to find himself, he's got to take a little bit from both worlds. He has this very conservative, traditional world that he's obviously being brought up in, the world of his family, and this new world, this new idea of uh, all these uh, pleasures of life are all for the taken, baby. You just got to go for it. How do you find that balance? And not only is that going to find or help Stephen find himself, that really is going to help him transition into adulthood. Because that is the transition to adulthood. You have to find that balance between a hard work and dedication, and you've got to have a little bit of fun now and then. So I think it, that's what really, what, that's how I found my connection with this piece, more or less. So I think that's an important little thing, just touch on right there. Because uh, beyond that, I don't know, man. I'm not sure how I feel about this. How come? It's a difficult text. I'm not going to argue that. Uh, it, it's a text to be appreciated. Appreciated. A uh, lot of good stuff going on. I just think there is so much going on with this that unless you just click with something, like Adrian, you click with that idea of you know, religion with this, Christianity, how you found your atheism. Unless you click immediately with something in this, it's just a little much, man. There's a lot going on. A little bit much in what way, though? So are, are you talking about the, the difficulty of the text just reading it, or are you talking about all of the things that are going on in the narration? Well, what do you want to focus on? Do you want to talk about the politics of Ireland at this period of time? Uh, well, I'd like to know in the reading what it was that, that threw you specifically uh, off. That's what, it's, it's what do you want to focus on? It's hard oh, to keep okay. track. So, so it was the things in the actual text. Absolutely It, it was so. not the writing of the text. No, the writing, I'm not arguing the writing. The writing is gorgeous. And it, Joyce is a master. You can flip to almost any little quote we have here. Uh, we talk about his soul was in flight. His soul was soaring in air. The idea of Daedalus is always there. It's always just it, tinging right there. The idea of the Irish politics are always in there. The idea of religion is always there. The idea of the birth of the artist is always there. Every little bit is there in every single paragraph. It's just you have to figure out what you want to focus on and go for to make it your reading. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what else to say about that. It's a difficult <laughs> thing to like sit here and verbalize. So let's move on. Okay. Um, we're playing a lot here with the idea of art versus God. Okay. Which, which would be at this time, I, I think at this time, very revolutionary because most of the great works of art that you have Religious works. are for God. Yes. Um, but James Joyce says not so. That is not necessary to the case. It's my first little line right here. Can the artist survive either with or without God? Because this would be the first time that we're really looking at, like you said, as a revolutionary idea. We have the idea of an artist for art's sake, for beauty's sake, not crediting God, not painting for God, not writing for God, an artist writing for himself and finding himself. So it is a big thing. It's a big deal. And we talked a little bit last week how this is a, uh, a good timing for this text as well. Because we're right on the cusp of World War One, when the world is changing. And that's, <laughs> if there's a time to question God, maybe that's it. That's one of the things that sprung from World War One. So before World War One, and maybe I'm mistaken, I'm far from an expert, but a lot of the writings that you get about nihilism are, hey, 
we're going to run through everything that doesn't work and we're going to figure out the good stuff. That's what nihilism means. Uh, there's a, a quote from Pease Rev I've given many times on the channel. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but it's basically strike out right, strike out left. Whatever is good will withstand the blow. What does not wasn't worth it anyway. Okay. World War I happened and a lot of people decided, you know what? Nothing withstands the blow. Nothing withstands the blow. So then nihilism did not become this strong motivating force. It became, well, nothing withstands the blow. Nothing's worth it. Okay. So there's these two sort of different nihilisms. And this, this, so nihilism forced a lot of people away from God, a lot of people away from religion. But it, it was not, nihilism was no longer the movement of see what stands up. Nihilism was the movement of nothing is worth anything. So instead of the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s being this time where what life means is we all get to create our own meaning. What life means is we all get to be an individual. It became what life means is nothing. And that was sort of, I think you have to wonder with texts like these laying groundworks, if something so big and awful as World War I and then later World War II hadn't thrown off the energy that was, let's create art for art's sake. Let's create art to discover. Let's create art to bring value to life instead of the afterlife. If those things had not been thrown off, where would we be? Would, would we still be having the great swings back and forth that we're noticing, right? Would we still be having all of the arguments on both extremes that we're having and nothing happening in the middle like we're having? Would the loudest voices be from the extremes? Or could the loudest, clearest voices be from the middle someplace? Okay. I don't think I've got an answer for you. I don't either. But we're sacrificing God for man? Or are we sacrificing God for art? Or... Are we sacrificing order for freedom? Okay, that's a good point. So sacrificing God for man is him leaving to discover who he is. Okay. Sacrificing God for art, he's obviously leaving so that he can create more freely. Sacrificing order for freedom, I think, is possibly the more interesting question here. He's leaving a life that was basically promised to him of order of not necessarily wealth, but certainly stability. You could have it all, Steve. Of rank. Absolutely. Uh, of prestige. And he's leaving that for freedom. It's a risk. It is. Is that what this novel is about? I like that idea. I do. Because uh, time and time throughout this novel, we see that Stephen is obviously a very promised student. A uh, promising student, excuse me. Uh, he's constantly talking about joining the priesthood, and that's not something that's offered lightly i mean somebody who's dedicated their life to the church dedicated their life to god is not just going to go up to every student and be like hey you can do this you got it baby but it seems time and time again that people take him aside and say hey you know i, I really think you have this in you you should consider this so stephen does show promise so to turn his back on all of that just to take a chance that is a big deal that's a huge deal it's something you don't get often and i, I honestly i when it works you get great things, but it rarely works. How do you mean? Well, someone with all this promise, somebody that has everything handed to him, everything's oh, fine, oh, 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 okay. taking that risk, when it pays out, it pays out, man. But wouldn't you rather? Wouldn't I, you, oh, rather you would take absolutely the risk? rather. It's a very romantic idea to do that. I'm about it. It's a, okay, so assuming the risk, assuming responsibility. Um, but you've always, so this is the argument I've made from, from day one. I was 19 and offered a store. Mm -hmm. I was 19 years old and I could have been a store manager then. Yeah. And I said, no, no, thank you. Again, at 22, they said, hey, what if we move you up into middle management? I said, no, I'm, I'm going to college. I'm going to, to get my degree. And again, before I left St. Joe with my degree to get my master's. And I said, no, 
no, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. And each time it became a little more serious because I was older. True. I was older and taking the risk again, starting from zero, when I had something comfortable offered to me. And the only reason I'm telling that story from my personal life is that is from where I have the, the vantage point to say, well, maybe this isn't about religion and art. Maybe it's about order and freedom. Okay. Right? I, I think that it, it takes some distance to say, okay, what if the church in this story doesn't stand for the church? What if it stands for what the church sort of is, which would be order? Okay. Versus what the mystery of leaving your entire country is. Sure is freedom, baby. It is. So I wonder if that's... I think during a lot of our discussions, we've been quagmired by the directness of what is in the text and not being able to take the church as symbolic. And again, he, he mentions Thoth and Ibis in the text. So we get this sort of, are we sacrificing our God for gods of uh, art, for gods of creation? Are we, are we sacrificing the creator God for gods of creation? Okay. And every time I say Thoth, I... I feel like I'm ordering more sauce on a sandwich. Can I have some more Thoth, please? And again, it comes down to the fact that no matter how you want to take this text, there's something for you there. Absolutely. Uh, Adrian. Yeah. We're getting towards the end of this. Yeah. How would you rate this? I think probably because I struggled so mightily. I'm giving this the lowest grade that I think you can give what you recognize as a great novel. This is a 90 for me. Okay. Uh, I, I will not argue the fact that it is a great novel. It, it, it is. It, no problem there. The writing's Chris. The writing's great. It just doesn't click for me. And again, maybe it's just me. Maybe I read this at the wrong What's time. What's the number? 86. 86 Hail Marys. It's a strong B. I hope you get crap in the comment. Who do you recommend? It's the road rule. I would recommend, if you want this journey, uh, this idea of uh, balance everything, Siddhartha, Herman Hess. Okay. I would recommend anything by Langston Hughes because I think that they are similar furnaces through which these artists were crystallized. Okay. That's fair. So if you like this kind of thing, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Give this video a like as well. We poured our hearts into James Joyce for weeks now. So please, give us a sympathy like, at the very minimum. If you'd like to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover Lit, there is a link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below. And please, stick around. A little bit after the credits, we're going to have a little free-form conversation, I think. We're yeah. going to talk about God. Yeah. Let's do this. So as promised to follow our review of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, uh, due to the religious overtones of the novel, we wanted to have a bit of a conversation about our religious beliefs and our uh, journey and path uh, to where we've become today. That makes no sense. Uh, where we are today. Uh, basically, our journey to atheism. Uh, both Adrian and I are atheists. Uh, we believe in no formal concept of God, and uh, that was a journey, especially growing up in the Midwest, and we figured it'd be a good uh, supplementary thing for a portrait of the artist to have a conversation on that. Uh, so, as growing up in my family, there are two parts. Uh, there's my father's side and my mother's side. Standard about any family, I'd imagine. Uh, I am a lot closer to my father's side than I am my mother's, but growing up, I spent a lot of time with my mother's side, uh, specifically my grandmother, my mother's mother. Uh, she played the organ at the local church in the small town we're from, so naturally I spent a lot of time in the church. I went through the uh, throes of Sunday school, Bible school, whatever you want to call it from where you're from, and it just never really clicked for me. I never had an interest for it. I never enjoyed going. I didn't like it. Uh, the church we went to was uh, called Town and Country Christian Church, a very small, uh, outside-of-town, country-style church, if you will. 
Uh, but it was a big deal for my grandmother. She was a very devout religious person. Uh, she always went to church. She played the organ. So I was always there. When I got to the point where I was old enough to stay home on my own, uh, my grandmother actually spent a lot of time raising us as kids. Uh, I, I just decided not to go. The opposite was the case with my youngest sister. She became very, very uh, enveloped in the church and explored that quite a bit. But it was just something that never clicked for me. It was never something I enjoyed and never something I wanted to pursue. Uh, as I got older, um, I guess the way, best way to put it is I started to explore religion more. Uh, I, I do enjoy exploring religion. I enjoy going to different churches, seeing how different people interact. Uh, at that period in time, I uh, became friends with some people who were Mormons. So I had gone to their church services a few times. Uh, very respectful of their service, and they were awesome. Uh, they knew that I wasn't really a religious person, so they never actually pushed anything on me. Uh, but they definitely invited me, and, you know, I, I got to enjoy the service, do some work afterwards. It's actually why I came with them, uh, was to do some film work with them. And got to experience that a little bit. I, at that point in time, and this is early high school for me, um, started dating a woman who was very devoutly Catholic. Uh, that became a thing. Uh, midnight Mass, Catholic Church services, which are fun, let me tell you. Uh, but still throughout this entire period of time, it just never clicked for me. Uh, I, I guess I should digress a little bit here. Uh, before this uh, high school experience, I, I started exploring religion a little bit more on my own. Apologies, the dog is looking out the window. Uh, and, and really started getting into different uh, ideas of spirituality and religion, which I think is the norm uh, for most people growing up. Uh, the idea of other religions being out there, there are other things... Uh, that's where I first started getting my taste of Eastern philosophy, looking into some more uh, natural spiritual religions, uh, the Wiccan idea of spirituality. I read quite a bit on uh, Druidism. Uh, just anything I could sink my teeth into because it was different. But the entire time I was like, ah, I don't buy into this. This just seems silly, but it is interesting to me. Uh, moving forward onto my college years, I actually took uh, some classes on religion. Uh, one, of bit, one of which was comparative religions with a Dr. Matthews, I believe. Uh, and that was extremely interesting to me, a very difficult course. Uh, but we went into a lot of different religions, a lot of Eastern philosophy, which was a very cool thing to me. It seemed more along the lines of this humanist approach that I was going towards. Uh, it wasn't really a religion, but more of a spirituality, which I enjoyed. Uh, but we talked a bit about that, uh, talked about Hindu religions, uh, traditional uh, Christian religions, all kinds of things, and looking at it all from a different light. Uh, and that really kind of opened up my exploration into religion quite a bit. And when I was working at the bookstore in college, that's when I first came across Hitchens, uh, the portable atheist. And I picked it up, and I read some of the literature in there, and I, I really dug it. And, like, I, I finally, like, came to terms of, like, okay, this is a thing. And growing up in the Bible Belt of the Midwest, that's a hard thing to come to terms with. Uh, everywhere you go, you are going to be just bombarded with religion. Uh, it's a very difficult conversation to have to somebody who is very conservatively religious, that, you know, you do not believe in their God. You're going to get, uh, you're going to get barked at quite a bit. And that's okay. Uh, it took some time to get to the point of uh, being comfortable with that. Uh, but that's what it really clicked for me is when I started reading uh, these works from all kinds of different people. Uh, I do remember specifically uh, Penn and Teller. Uh, Penn Gillette, that's his name. Penn Gillette had an article in The Portable Atheist that I really dug. Uh, and since then, that it was all downhill. I was uh, uh, no more really searching for religion, but reading about things that I would tend to agree with. Uh, going into the atheist side of things, reading uh, Penn Gillette's articles, a lot of Dawkins, uh, a lot of Hitchens. Hitchens was hugely inspirational for me. And that got me to where I am today. Now, it's still fascinating to me. I still like to read about other religions. I recently read Siddhartha for the first time, and that was a great thing. Um, I, I would say at this point, still definitely atheist. There's nothing that I'm really digging into that I would say I wholeheartedly believe. Uh, but this idea of this humanist approach towards things, this spirituality of uh, basically, don't be a dick, be a good person to other people, I I've always kind of held that near and dear. And I think that's where a lot of the idea of Eastern philosophy as the ideas of Eastern philosophy have really influenced me and uh, interested me because it, you get a lot of that in there. 
So a, a bit of a ramble. I apologize if I kind of went off track there, but uh, that's where I am today. Uh, and the best way I've always put it if, for somebody who's upset by that concept is in order to be in a religion, you have to have a certain degree of faith. I do not possess that faith. That may change in the future. If it does, I'm open to it. Uh, but at this period of time, it has not. And I'm still very comfortable with where I am today. But we'll see what 10 years brings. People change. That's normal. Uh, and it's, uh, it's part of this journey of life that we have. So anyway, this was my spiel on religion as a whole. Hope you enjoyed this little chat here. And hope you enjoyed the Portrait of the Artist as Young Man full review. We put a lot of work into it. And as always, thank you for watching Strip Cover Lit. If you like this kind of thing, make sure you hit the like button down below. Give this video a like as well. And subscribe. And as always, if you'd like to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover, there's a lit link, as always, to our Patreon to be found in the description below. So, my story with religion sort of goes back to, obviously, like most people's, to childhood. And my family was not a church-going family, but definitely Christian. And even, even early on, there was a lot of things that just didn't make sense to me and I wasn't sure if they were supposed to be stories that we learned something from or if they were supposed to be um, genuine accounts the the flood myth um, Jonah in the belly of the whale things like that never really rang true to me and I, I, I sort of carried those things with me for a long time not sure what to do with them not sure how to feel about them not sure if that made me a, a bad person, if that made me somehow flawed, because you you always hear with religion that you're not supposed to question it, that you're just supposed to accept it, and I, that was never really the case for me, though I never disavowed the religion. Things, I was always a God-fearing person. I feared what would happen if I didn't believe. I feared what would happen if I was not true to the faith. Things like that. Um, and then I had a, a woman in my life that was very, very religious. And I started going to church a little bit with her. And the more, the more we went the less I found I could actually believe. The more stories from the Bible sounded farcical, sounded just silly. And then one summer, um, I was nearing, maybe I'd already graduated with my undergraduate degree. And I was, I was looking for answers and I was on YouTube and the internet is the death of religions, I think. And I started searching all of the questions that I had. And I was searching on YouTube. And this led me to Christian versus atheist debates, which I never really I never really leaned towards atheism. I always thought, well, if if Christianity isn't the answer, some type of God is. And I kept coming across these videos with Christopher Hitchens. And the more I watched, the more I realized, yeah, I, I really sort of agree with a lot of the things this guy says, but hey man, people way smarter than me in the past have been Christian, and people way smarter than me now believe in God. So if, if they do, why wouldn't I? But everything this guy, Christopher Hitchens, kept saying made so much sense. So much sense. And eventually I realized I was rooting for him in these discussions. Not that he needed my rooting for him, but I was nonetheless. And um, agreeing with everything that came out of his mouth. And that really, for me, that, that was the beginning of actual questioning and the end um, so that's really sort of been my experience and I I know that's not much to, to say 
that's not much to digest, but that's all it really took for me. Uh, and some might say that that is a sign of weakness of my faith, and that I was never really a true believer, but I assure you, I I believed. And not only that, I never even, like I said, when I started questioning religion, it was never a matter of maybe there's nothing at all. It's maybe I was just wrong about this book, but surely some other book has the answers. But, um, I don't know, I, I think that's, uh, that's sort of it. Just bleep it out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Restart that. <laughs> One I would have let go, but just spit two out before we even started.